Well, there, there's a lot of people today that are all asking the same question. That question is, is there a God? There's a lot of people today that are wondering that. Is there a God who created all of us? But truthfully, we're one of the first civilizations to really ask this question. Most ancient civilizations and groups of people that preceded us, they didn't ask this question because in their mind, of course, there is a God. How in the world could all of this world have come into being if there's not a God? Really, they were asking a different question. Now, the Bible actually opens up with an assumption that if you're reading it, you believe there is a God because the Bible begins with in the beginning God. It begins with an assumption that the readers understand there is a God. It's just then the Bible moves into introducing you to the God that the story of the Bible is going to tell you about. But for us, the question that we should really be asking is not so much is there a God, it's actually the question that most ancient civilizations actually asked that many of us are struggling with in some capacity as well. Is God knowable? Is God knowable? Can we actually be close to him? Does he listen when we pray to him? Does he notice when we worship him? Because have you ever had an experience where you felt like maybe God wasn't listening to the prayers that you had offered. You asked and maybe even begged and pleaded for something to happen, but it didn't work out, and you wondered, does God actually listen when I pray? Or things were going wrong in your life, and you're wondering, does God notice when I show up to worship him? And really, you're asking the same question, is God noticeable. And we're, we're not the first people to wonder that. Even Israel, the Israelites who saw God on display was asking the same question. And part of that is because of how God displayed himself to the ancient Israelites. If you remember the story of Israel coming out of Egypt that you read about in the book of Exodus, the second book in the Bible, there God's going to perform these 10 plagues over the Egyptians, these powerful signs to prove not only excuse me, not only his existence, but specifically the fact that he is the one true God. And so the last final plague is the one that Pharaoh finally said, get out of here, leave. And so they begin to leave and Pharaoh's army pursues them and they cross the Red Sea and then they're going to be led by the way that God is going to show himself to them. And he showed up in this pillar of cloud and fire. Now, I think this might be some type of AI generated image. So I'm not sure that this is exactly what it looked like. None of us were there. We don't really know. But here's what we know. Israel never struggled with the question, is there a God? All they had to do was look up and see there is God. But their struggle was, is that God knowable. Because when the demonstration or the visible manifestation of God is a pillar of fire, a pillar of fire, that's not necessarily the most inviting image to draw close. Now, fire can be inviting, right? When it's small and contained and you build you a fire in the backyard and you're going to roast some marshmallows or maybe that two weeks out of the year it gets cold around here and you actually warm yourself by the fire. But there are some fires that are not inviting because they're not controlled. And we don't necessarily run up to an uncontrolled fire to get warmth because we don't know if it's going to destroy us or not. And the Israelites weren't really sure about this pillar of fire, whether or not it was controlled because it was so powerful. And so for Israel, for much of what you read about them in the Bible, they kind of followed God from a distance. They didn't really draw close to him. And for many of us, that's kind of been our story as well. We followed God, but kind of at arm's length. Because one of the things about God's holiness, while it's powerful and beautiful and majestic, for us who struggle with it, we struggle with the invitation to draw close. We see God's holiness and separateness that we'll talk about next week. But that intimacy that God is inviting us into, we struggle with because he's so powerful. And yet we know there is a God. But is God knowable? I think that's what Jesus was getting at when he was teaching his disciples to pray. 
You can read about it in Luke chapter 11 or Matthew chapter 6. In Luke 11, the disciples have watched Jesus pray, and then they come to him and they said, Lord, teach us to pray like that. There was something different about how Jesus prayed than how they had prayed. And they grew up in a society and a culture that highly valued prayer where they would have prayed multiple times a day. But something was different about how Jesus talked to God. And they said, we want to pray like that. And so then Jesus showed them how to pray. And so for the next several weeks, we're going to look at this prayer specifically out of Matthew's account in Matthew chapter 6. The wording's just slightly different in Luke's account, and so we're primarily going to stay in Matthew's account. And here's what he told them to do. The very first line, our Father in heaven. I just wonder if for the disciples, if their jaw hit the ground over that line. Now, I don't know if you grew up reciting the Lord's Prayer. I didn't really grow up reciting the Lord's Prayer, if I'm being perfectly honest with you. Maybe this has been something you've been reciting forever. In fact, maybe when Daniel read it to us, you're sitting there and you're like, Our Father, who are you were reciting the King James Version. Many of us were, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And uh, you were just rolling along because you've said it so many times. Our oldest daughter plays softball, and at the end of every softball game, they come around the circle in the middle, and one of the young ladies, whoever decides to do it, will ask the question, who's father? And then they all, in unison, start to recite the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. And sometimes, it's more like, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. And I'm like, I can't, this is like an auctioneer that's praying this prayer, and I'm trying to really pay attention to it, but I can't even keep up, and they're, they're done before I even get to the third line. I remember when I was a kid playing basketball in the YMCA League, we got done with the game, and <clears throat> we came together, and we're going to have a prayer there at the end, and the coach said, let's pray. Now, I grew up in church my whole life, just not in a church that really recited the Lord's Prayer. I mean, I had heard it primarily from a commercial that played on TV most of the time, and I kind of knew it, but didn't really know it, you know what I mean? And so he said, let's pray. So I bowed my head, and I assumed, like I had grown up my whole life, he would lead the prayer. I would listen and then say amen at the end. And he started to recite the Lord's Prayer, and so did every other young man in that circle but me. I didn't know what I didn't know what to say. So I did what every church kid would do. I just pretended. And I just moved my mouth so that they would think I knew the Lord's Prayer when I did not and got in the car afterward and my parents were like, you didn't know what they were saying, did you? And I was thinking, yeah, because you failed me as parents. Way to go, mom. I'm just kidding. I didn't say that. I was just like, no, I didn't really know it. I probably should learn that a little bit better. And even since then, how many times have you just kind of rolled through your prayer? And not even paid attention to these opening words that are so powerful to us as believers. Our Father in heaven. So what I want us to focus on this morning, we're going to get to the part about hallowed be your name next week. Because I think that's a whole lesson in and of itself. When Jesus taught his disciples to pray our Father in heaven... I think they were completely shocked that's how he began his prayer because they did not address God as Father. They addressed God as Adonai, which means Lord. In fact, in Israel's history, the name God had given to them, Yahweh, which we talked about over the summer, they had stopped using for fear of taking God's name in vain. So they didn't even call God by his covenant name that he said, this is the name you will call me by. They were like, that's a great name. Let's make sure we don't take it in vain again so we'll never use it. So they came up with this other term, Adonai, which means Lord. And they viewed God in a very respectful way. They're honoring him for his holiness. But God was trying to invite them into intimacy. And Jesus Jesus began his prayer not with a reminder about holiness. He's going to get to that in the second line. Instead, he's going to begin with an invitation into intimacy. And I just wonder if their jaw hit the ground when Jesus called God Father because they didn't do that. That was such a close, intimate term. But for us, what he's teaching us is something so profound. In fact, a couple of things that I think we need to learn this morning. What does it mean for God to be Father? The first one is to trust within his character. Now, I don't know what your family life was like growing up. Maybe you grew up in a home where you had a great earthly father, a man who loved the Lord, who loved you, who taught you, and who provided for you 
you. Maybe you grew up in a home completely the opposite. Maybe he was a, a, a complete mean individual, did not care for you, maybe abandoned. I have no idea. My guess is we're either, either extreme or somewhere in the middle. But here's what I know. Regardless of how good or bad your father was, he wasn't perfect. And in some capacity, you've projected that view onto God in some capacity. And maybe for some of us sitting in this room, we have a hard time referring to God as Father because of our earthly father, and we don't really like the concept there. And maybe for some of us, we have an easier time referring to God as Father, but then there's just those moments where our father, even a good father, failed us because all of us fathers are completely imperfect and flawed individuals. And it impacted us in some point, and so maybe one time we called God Father, and what we saw in our mind was, or dad raising his voice or got a little frustrated or angry or whatever that flaw was, and we projected it. And Satan loves to take whatever that is, as little or extreme as it can be, and to try to place doubt in your relationship with God. And he didn't start with you. In fact, you can go back to the third page of your Bible, to Genesis chapter 3, and you're going to read a story of the first time Satan tried to get someone to doubt their relationship with their heavenly father. You go all the way back to the Garden of Eden, and there God has created this man and woman, placed them in this garden, and the first command he gave them is he said, you can eat freely from any tree in the garden. That's the first command. You can eat freely from any tree in the garden. Enjoy yourself. God's relationship with us has always been about generosity. But he also wants to give us opportunities to demonstrate love. And love is demonstrated through choice. And so he said, of any tree you can freely eat except this one. That's called the tree of knowledge of good and evil. An incredibly long name for a tree if you really think about it. And that tree was a test to determine would they trust God's generosity to eat freely and to trust his love and to avoid the one. And here comes the serpent that we know is Satan, the devil himself, embodied in a snake. And he begins to place doubt in Eve's mind. He didn't tempt her with fruit. He tempted her to doubt her trust in God. And that's exactly what he does for us. He's trying to get us to doubt God's love and our trust in him. He wants us to that God is holding out on us, that there's something better out there that God just doesn't want you to enjoy because he's trying to control you. That's how Satan operates. He started with Eve, and he's been perfecting it all the way down to us and to our children. Because if he can get us to doubt God's character, he can get us to disobey God's commands. But John, in his, one of his letters that's recorded toward the end of the Bible, said this is love for God. What does it mean to demonstrate love for God? It's to keep his commands. You don't keep his commands so that God loves you. You keep his commands as a demonstration of love because isn't that how it works in every relationship? It doesn't matter what the relationship is, there are certain boundaries in that relationship and you demonstrate your love and trust in that individual by observing and staying within those boundaries. My wife and I have certain rules or boundaries in our relationship that I don't violate and that she doesn't either. For our children, we have certain rules, if you will, they are boundaries that are there for, ter for their protection, right? Because every relationship has to have boundaries, but... For those of us that were, are older, do you remember when you were a teenager? We have some awesome teenagers at our church, don't we? And none of them are rebellious at all. I just know that. They're all perfect, right? Okay? Your parents at some point, including me, had little rebellious streaks. Some of us longer rebellious streaks than others. Some of us lasted longer than our adolescence, right? Some of us still on that streak. God's trying to bring us back around. We took the scenic route. Others of us, for a little short season of life, it doesn't matter. There was all, for every one of us, there was this moment in our lives where those that were over us, parent or guardian, whoever it was, they had certain rules, but you felt like you knew better. And if you thought about trust as a bank account, you're trust account with your parents or guardians was at an all-time low as an adolescent because you thought they were holding out on you. You thought they were limiting you, and you viewed their rules as burdens. 
Now, I'm the third of three children. I'm the baby. I didn't have many rules because I was not a bad kid. I was the best kid my parents could have ever asked for. So my brother and sister know this way better than I do as far as feeling limited by rules. If they had just been better kids, they wouldn't have had to have so many rules. And I know some of you struggle with that because you're the oldest or the second oldest, and you're like, man, I had so many rules. Well, you should have been the youngest. And it's all about how we view our parents' boundaries. But really, it's not about the boundaries. It's about trust and how much we're trusting their character. Because when we trust someone's character, we have a greater understanding of what they are actually providing for us when they set certain boundaries. The Bible calls them commands. And sometimes those of us with authority complexes are like, I don't like commands. They're guardrails. They're boundaries for our protection. It's not that God is holding out. He's trying to keep us from destruction. That's why John wrote his commands are not burdensome because John's trust in God was so full. His bank account, his trust account was so rich that he said, every one of those commands is not a burden because God's not withholding something from me. But that's what Satan wants us to doubt, to doubt God's character. But when Jesus prayed our Father in heaven, he's reminding us who God is and how much we can actually trust him. That's the first thing. The second thing is that when we pray our Father in heaven, we're reminding ourselves the very basis of our identity. So going back to the Garden of Eden, when Eve first ate that fruit, she not only doubted God's character, but she actually changed the way she viewed God. She viewed him less as father, less than a father. And as a result, her image of herself became less than a daughter because that's what shame does. She didn't know it on the other side of eating that fruit came this awful thing called shame. And for many of us, we had no idea either that on the other side of whatever that behavior was, that addiction, that moment, that decision that we thought was going to be freeing and liberating and so amazing was complete destruction. And with it came this idea called shame and and it robbed us. It changed how we viewed ourselves because that's what the enemy does. Jesus said the thief. He called Satan the thief because of what he came to do. The first thing he came to do was to steal your identity. He wants to steal who you think you are in God's eyes. He wants to change the way you view yourself and as a result, how you view yourself to God. Because, yeah, a really great question to think about is, what does God think about? But an even greater question to ask is, what does God think about when he thinks about me? Because how you answer that question is really the basis of your identity. And he stole our identity as child of God, and what he left us with was something like liar or addict or adulterer. And he left us with that identity, failure. Whatever it is, that term that you feed yourself that's coming from the enemy himself, that lie you believe over and over again. And as a result, he killed our self-image. We no longer view ourselves as children of God created in his image. Instead, we view ourselves as something completely different. And as a result, he destroyed our life. But Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full, they may have a restoration of their identity. Yes, every person is created by God, but not every person is his child because we all have eaten the fruit. We've walked away from him, turned our back on him, and as a result, allowed our identity to be stolen. But Jesus came into this world to answer the question, is God knowable? And the answer to that question is yes. Not only is he knowable, but he's knowable as a father who will restore your identity, who will re-deliver to you not only the proper image of yourself, but life that was destroyed by the devil. That's one of the things we're reminding ourselves of when we pray our Father in heaven. Here's the last one. It means to be a part of his family. Do you remember what happened in Genesis 3? They eat the fruit, and then they, their eyes are opened, and they realize they 
needed to cover themselves because before it said they were naked and unashamed, but now all of a sudden they are naked and ashamed. And so they go and hide from one another and they hide from God and they try to hide themselves. And isn't that what we do? Our ours looks a little bit different. We're still doing the same thing, just in different ways. We're still hiding from one another because all of us are struggling with something. We're all being attacked by the same enemy with something. We're all battling sin of some capacity. We're all battling some type of maybe false identity, lies from the enemy. We're battling some type of emotional challenge, spiritual challenge, physical challenge, physiological challenge, financial challenge, whatever it is, we're all dealing with something. And we did what Adam and Eve did, try to hide. And so life's falling apart, but getting ready to walk into a room where we should be able to be vulnerable and we feel like we've got to hide more than anywhere else. So we put on our smiles and we dress nice to hide whatever it is that is vulnerable. And as a result, the more often we do that, the more comfortable we get with that. And so week after week, we just keep on laying layer after layer of inauthenticity inauthenticity and fakeness. And we do really good with wearing masks and disguises. And we have things like trunk or treat. We're like, oh, the kids look so cute in their costumes. And then Sunday morning we show up and we're like, don't we all look cute in our costumes? No, I'm not saying you look like you dressed up. I'm saying some of us are getting really good at hiding what's actually going on in our lives. And the Bible's very clear that where there is hiding, there can be no healing. That's why James wrote these words in James 5. He said, confess your sins to one another. And pray for one another so that you might be healed. Isn't it interesting that he ties confession and prayer to healing? Don't miss that connection. Every one of us wants healing. We're dealing with something that we're like, God, I just, I want you to provide the healing. And God's saying, I'd love to provide the healing, but I can't heal what you're still hiding. Hiding it from God as if he can't see it. Hiding it from one another as if we can't share it. And the answer is confession. Now, does that mean you need to confess everything to every person that's in this room? Not necessarily. Maybe, maybe that's what God is calling you to do. But maybe the one another is a group of people that you can trust. Small group of people that will pray for you and encourage you. Because he says the prayer of righteous and effective people is powerful and effective. What's not powerful and ineffective, it's hiding. Because we find no healing. And so, yeah, it requires us to be vulnerable, to do the things that scares us the most, to share weakness because of what we're so afraid of. We're afraid of judgment. But he doesn't say confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you can be judged. Because, you know, that, that's real transformation. You've met so many people in your life who made radical changes in their life because somebody judged them. No, that's never been the case. Judgment doesn't bring change. What brings change is love. And mercy and grace. It's the same thing that changed all of our hearts back toward Jesus, back toward this God who is knowable. And that's where we find healing. Saying, hey, I'm not just struggling, but here's what I'm actually struggling with. And I need you to pray for me. And it's like the floodgates of God's mercy are now opened because we had built up so many walls to hide whatever it is we're struggling with. And we made that wall really, really high. And then his grace just broke through. And here comes the waters pouring forth, waters of mercy and grace. And those that you shared it with, just wrap their arms around you, pray for you, love you, and say, hey, this might be crazy, but here's what I'm struggling with. And all of a sudden, confession becomes just a very regular thing. Because we're not worried about being judged. Because how in the world can we be judged when we're all dealing with something? And we start to find healing. So that true change can take place. All because we prayed. Our Father in heaven. Because if our intimacy with God 
is not there, it's going to fracture our, our relationships with one another. And maybe you don't feel like you can trust these people because you're not totally sure if you can trust God. I hope you'll understand those two concepts are directly connected. You can trust your brothers and sisters in Christ because you can trust God. We're all his family. And when we pray our Father, we're reminding ourselves and one another we're brothers and sisters. We're family. We are siblings in the faith. All children of the same father. And it reminds us as we pray that prayer, our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. It reminds us who God is. It reminds us who we are. And it reminds us who we are for one another. What a challenging prayer. So, is God knowable? Yes, more than you actually know. And he's inviting every one of us into deeper relationship with him. So I've got a prayer challenge for you. I don't know if you took the challenge last week. If you did, it's not too late. You can go back and watch that message. And the challenge was simply this, to before you start praying, to allow God to have the first word, to just sit and be still in silence, for at least 60 seconds with palms upward to just receive the rest that God is offering. I don't know what you experienced and what you learned through all of that. What I learned is my heart and mind were just racing like crazy. Man, and it took more than 60 seconds to just calm the mind before I unloaded everything to God. And it's just a reminder to rest in Him as our but here's my challenge for you this week. If you're a praying person, this is not going to be in very, it's not going to be hard at all. It's just going to require you to pause and focus on something. If you don't, if you're not in a regular habit of prayer, it's not going to be difficult. In fact, you can pick however you want to, if you want to recite the Lord's Prayer every day this week, whatever you want to do, here's all I'm going to ask you to do. Your prayer challenge for this week is pay attention to how you begin your prayer. Pay attention. Some of us begin our prayers with Lord. Some of us begin our prayers with God. Some of us begin our prayers with Father. I've known people who prayed the word Father like 72 times in about a 20-second prayer. Uh, Father's like comma, okay? It's like, dear Lord, instead of saying comma, they said Father, dear Lord, Father, and Father. That's okay. I don't want to knock anybody's prayer life, right? Just pay attention to how you talk to God, specifically how you are addressing him. And if you're not in the habit of addressing God as Father, I want to tell you this week to do that. For that verbal reminder to remind you who he is to us, who we are to him, who we are to one another. And if you do regularly begin your prayers with Father, don't just blow through that. My Father. Allow that statement to speak deeply into your heart and to see what it prompts from your heart that God is one thing to address. I think it will speak powerfully to you as God reveals things within your own heart. Maybe just like he did in your 60 seconds of silence. If you're here this morning and you've never, never been baptized into Christ, we want to encourage you to consider that so that God can be your father. I said it earlier, every person is created by God, but not every person is God's child because we become God's children by surrendering our lives to him, being baptized into Christ, being washed clean from our sins and rising to walk not only in newness of life that Jesus told us, but this new identity as a child of God. And that's a blessing that God wants to share with you. It's a new relationship that he wants to begin with you today so that you can pray, my Father in heaven. And we long to celebrate that with you today and to see you raised to walk in newness of life. If you're here this morning and you've just been beaten down, you've bought the lies of the enemy, you've not fully received this identity that God is trying to give to you, you're battling something that you've been hiding, 
Our shepherds are going to be up front and in the back, and they'd love to pray with you. If you want us to pause as a church family and to pray over you, we'd love to do that. If you need to cross the aisle today or if you need to afterward to ask somebody to call for you this afternoon or later this week, or you need to call somebody or text them to ask for prayer, every one of us has an opportunity to respond to our Father who is in heaven. He's inviting us toward him. The question is, will we take that next step. If we can encourage you in any way, please let us know as together we stand and sing.